I came to, to wine fairly late on in my, in my career. I spent uh, the first 20 years in the city um, being a money broker and enjoying all the perks that went with it, including expense accounts, going to lunch, going down the wine bar, etc., etc. So when that came to an end, it was a case of what did I want to do? Well, I fancy playing professional golf, but if you've ever seen my golf swing, you realize that was never going to happen. So we jumped into the wine game and I just found wine fascinating. Um, and so I, I basically just went and learned a lot more about wine. So I took all the wine exams, then I ended up working for a few wine companies, and then I spent um, eight to nine years working for the Wine and Spirits Education Trust. I was a wine buyer there and one of their lecturing team, and I basically taught people in the wine trade about wine. And then from there, I've gone to Berries, and one of the things I find interesting is how wine or how wine and food pair well together. And that's sort of you like a hobby that I've just run with. To a lot of people, matching food to wine isn't something that they really are ever going to bother to do. Um, if, for argument's sake, if, if you're one of the kind of person that sits down, that likes to go around the supermarket, that likes to buy the organic chickens because they taste a bit better, if you like the fact that you end up to, you go to your local Waitrose, there's six or seven different types of potatoes, because the King Edwards make the best roasting potatoes and the waxy Charlotte potatoes make the best ones in salads, you're thinking about food, you like your food, now you're the kind of person that's actually going to sit down and try and work out what is the best wine to go with your food. The reality is, if you get the right wine with the right food, the food tastes better and the wine tastes better. But not everybody's going to go down that route. There are lots of people who will quite happily say, chicken is chicken is chicken. My favourite drink is, I don't know, Cabernet Sauvignon from Bulgaria. I'm happy with that. Thank you very much indeed. Let's not bother. And there's lots of people who, who think that way. And again, there's always somebody who likes something really odd pairing. They just do. You know, people have different tastes. I call it the um, vintage port and cornflakes syndrome. There's always somebody somewhere who thinks vintage port with cornflakes is a good idea. It doesn't make them wrong, it makes them strange, it makes them weird, and it makes them a very small minority of the general public, but it doesn't make them wrong. So, you know, if you like something, have it. What I'm trying to say is there's a few rules that will help you get this thing right. Because let's be honest, there's thousands and thousands of different dishes and there's thousands and thousands of different wines. The basic rules to matching your food to your wine so you can take it and use it in every situation whether you're being having a home dinner party or you're going to be in a restaurant are oh, there are five basic rules to matching food to wine the first basic rule and the most important rule is the weight of the wine must match the weight of the food there's no good having a big heavyweight wine going with a really lightweight food therefore if you've got a really light souffle you need a light wine if you've got a big heavy casserole you need a big heavy wine that's going to go with it. The weight of the food, the next thing you're trying to match is the flavour and the intensity of flavour. People get this mixed up. People seem to think that the weight of the food and of, or the flavour of some food is a weighty food. It doesn't have to be. If you think about red and green peppers, they are, well, they're mostly water, but they've got lots and lots of flavour to them, but not a great deal of weight. So if you like peppers, are a very flavoursome food, but very light in weight. On the other end of the scale, uh, boiled rice, boiled potatoes, they're heavyweight food, but not a great deal of flavour. So you're trying to match, if you can, the flavour that's in your food with the flavour that's in your wine. But, I mean, I, there are no wines in the world that smell and taste of roast pork, roast lamb, beef, etc. It's nearly always the thing it goes with that you're actually trying to match it with. Which is why when people turn around and go to, a, to the Indian restaurant, they sit there, they pick up the wine list, they look at it for half an hour or 20 minutes, they put it down and go, kind of a beer please? Because there's such intense flavours there, they go for the neutral way out. So if you can match the flavour, great. If you can't, take a step back. And I say by matching the flavour, if you, do you like roast pork? If you have roast pork on a Sunday, do you like to have some apple sauce on the side? Lovely. Well, you could match your wine with an apple flavour with the apple sauce to go with the pork. If you like, you've got a, a joining combination. The fact that one food goes with another food, then that other food might go with your wine. That's one way of looking at matching it. But if you can't match it, e.g. you're having the chicken madras, go for something neutral. Go for something light, neutral wine if you want wine. And the best example of that is Italian wine. If you look at Italian wine, or you turn around to an Italian winemaker and you say, what kind of wines do you make? He said, I make red, I make white. What do you make your white to go with? And he'll look at you and say, I make it to go with antipasta. And you go, what's antipasta? 
He goes, well, give me three sheets of paper and a pen, half an hour, he'll give you 250 different anti-pastas. If you've got 350 different types of food and you want one wine to go with them all, that wine's got to be pretty middle of the road. It's got to be medium bodied, medium acidity, not have a great deal of flavour, and that's pretty much a tasting note for nearly all Italian wine. Suave or Vietto, all those things that go with lots of different antipastas is pretty much a middle, middle ground, fairly neutral wine. So that's what you do. If you can match the flavour, great. If you can't, step back and just be reasonably neutral. The third thing you've got to try and do, so first of all you've done the weight, then you've tried to do the flavour, is you must match the acidity. The acidity in the food has to match the acidity in the wine. If the acidity in the wine is higher, then the wine will seem thin, sharp and not very good. And acidity is often something that you add to food. If you turn around and you, I don't know, you're having fish and chips, what do you put on the chips? You put your vinegar, bang, you've just added acidity to your food. If you turn around and you make a salad dressing, how do you make a salad dressing? Well, you know, you can either open a bottle or you take the olive oil out, you put some flavoring in there, and then what do you add? You either add vinegar, you might add lemon juice, you've now just added acidity into the food mix. You've now got to think about that when you choose the wine. One of the most commonly used um, ingredients in, f in any cooking are tomatoes. And tomatoes are one of the most acidic ingredients we have that you buy from the supermarket every day. Anything with tomatoes in it, will have a reasonable amount of acidity because tomatoes have pretty good acidity in them. And in fact, actually, when you buy tomatoes in this country, they have even far more acidity than most tomatoes because to give it the shelf life that the supermarkets want, which is normally about three months, they pick them in the green, they put them in a the gas blanket, it turns the outside skin completely red and the inside is unripe and it's really got quite high acid levels. So if you have tomatoes in a dish, you're going to have to have pretty good acidity on your wine. Nearly all Italian red wines have good acidity and nearly all Italian food dishes have tomatoes in one form or another, which is one of the reasons why Italian wine goes with tomato-based sauces. It's a staple of Italy. Then you've got to sit there and think, once you've done those three things, I've got to think about bitterness and tannins. You get tannins in the skin of a grape. If you take a grape, whether it be a red grape or a white grape, and you cut that grape in half, all the colour and all the tannins is held in the skin of a grape. And if you think about a grape, if you think about just eating a grape, the nicest part of the grape is the fleshy stuff on the inside with no colour. It has all the sweetness, has all the juice, it's really rather nice. Then if you just chew the skins, you've got quite a bit of colour, you've got quite a bit of flavour, but you've also got some bitterness in the skins as well. And if you actually chew the pips, that's where you get all those horrible bitter oils. So if you're going to use the skins and you're going to make a wine using the skins, you're going to get some bitterness with them and you're going to get tannins. The real difference between making white wine and red wine is white wine, you take grapes, they can be white, they can be red, you squeeze the juice out of those grapes, you throw the skins away, you ferment the juice. To make red wine, you can only make it with red grapes, and now you ferment the juice and the skins together to get the colour, and you will also get the tannins. The thicker the skin of a grape, the more colour, the more tannin it will have in it. One of the thickest skin grape varieties you can find is Cabernet Sauvignon. It makes wines coming from Bordeaux, and wines from Bordeaux are generally very deep in colour, have lots of tannin, and are long-lived, simple on the back of the thickness of their skins. You go to a different grape variety, something like Pinot Noir, has one of the thinnest skins you can find anywhere. It's made some of the lightest, least tannin wines you can find. So the thickness of the skin gives you, or doesn't give you, how much tannin. It, it, it affects how much tannin will be in the finished wine. Why do we care about this? Well, if you eat something which has got fatty protein molecules in it, if you think about eating Think about eating a great big juicy steak, and it's going to take you 20 mouthfuls to eat that great big juicy steak. What are the most flavours and mouthfuls? Is it mouthfuls 1 and 2, or 19 and 20? Nick? 1 and 2. Correct. By 19 and 20, your taste buds go bored, bored, bored. I've had 20 mouthfuls of this. I'm fed up. Get on with dessert. You can't taste as well mouthfuls 19 and 20, because the fat content in that meat coats your taste buds, and it sits on your taste buds. So you want to be able to drink something between mouthfuls that then gets rid of that fat that's coating your taste buds and stopping your taste buds from tasting, and red wine does that. The tannins in red wine love fatty protein molecules. They just want to latch hold of them. This is going to sound a little bit disgusting, but bear with me. Your saliva is chock-a-block full of fatty protein molecules, and when you drink a tannic red wine, you get that gum-drying sensation down the side of your cheeks. That's because the saliva has dripped down the side of your face. It collects down here by your gums. When you drink the tannic red wine, it finds the fatty protein molecules in your saliva. It latches hold of them, and that's what causes your gums to dry out. 
So the final thing you've got to try and match, and after this we're going to talk about what is it that makes a really good dish. The final thing you must match is sweetness. Sweetness works very well with lots of things. It works very well with savoury, but we turn around these days and say, well, we don't want sweet wines with our savoury courses, we want dry wines. But normally sweet wines are drunk at the end of a meal, and the golden rule is the wine must be sweeter than the dish it goes with. If your dish is sweeter than the wine, the wine will seem poor. So the wine must be sweeter than the dessert it's paired with every time.